uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to present a, a, a quite general uh, lecture today. I, I want to give you some, some ideas about recent progress on a very old topic, which is the understanding uh, and modeling of ductile fracturing metals for, from a, a, a micromechanical and microstructure viewpoint. Uh, the work I will present today is essentially the result of uh, the PhD of Florent Anard, huh, the second name you see on the screen, of Julien Leclerc, a PhD student uh, in, at the University of Liège, and the work also of two postdocs, uh, Van Zung and Mathieu Marteleur, uh, one on the modeling part and the other one on the experimental part, as well as other colleagues, another postdoc, Marie-Stéphane Collat, and you probably recognize names, you know, Eric May from Lyon, Otsimar, and Ludovic Nulz. Um, what I would like to, to discuss today, I will come to the outline after, but I just want to, to start with uh, going back to the basics. So this is a schematic uh, we, we, we proposed uh, six, seven years ago, and I keep reusing it to cover what are the, the different classes of ductile fracture phenomena from the extreme left, where you see uh, very pure metals that, that would uh, basically undergo failure just by accumulation of plasticity, almost to infinite deformation. There is no damage mechanism, so you get localization, uh, necking or, or shear banding localization, and just extremely large deformation up to a point. The extreme right is a process where the entire failure is dominated by cavities that nucleate and grow and the microstructure is complicated. So you may have voids nucleating here and not there. And then some of the voids, they will join and create a micro crack where in other parts of the, of the material, they're still at an immature state. And in between you have a range of, of uh, combinations and, and, and complications. Um, so for instance, the in number two case is where because of low strain hardening capacity, typically, or certain types of loading conditions, you may generate plastic localization. And within the plastic localization, necking or shear bend, you will, due to the large strains and perhaps also to the increase of the triaxiality state, you will generate voids that at the end will be responsible for the fracture. But the opposite is also true. Sometimes the damage nucleates very early in the process of deformation. And because of the softening induced by the presence of the voids, that accelerates the, the, the localization phenomenon. And, and so that makes the process very complicated to, to monitor and to understand because you, you have the damage and then the damage is uh, affecting the way plastic localization takes place. Now, in some circumstances, um, the, the distribution of void is, is relatively irregular, homogeneous, almost periodic. And then you have a, a phenomenon of relatively homogeneous growth of the damage, and then suddenly a, a big um, void coalescence band is, is occurring. I'm showing this one because this is the typical one uh, we tend to model uh, when we, we perform finite element simulation, where we put discrete voids in the mesh. And of course, by putting regular distribution of voids, we're, we're missing some of the, of the phenomena on, on, the, on the box number five. And I've put some, um, some examples on the top you can read about where you find these different uh, phenomena. So today I will essentially focus on uh, three, four, five, uh, and essentially on, on number five, which is the most typical for, for, for the best uh, metals that are available. So they are usually uh, limited amount of capacity or, or um, nucleation agents, a limited number of inclusions. And so they, they are prone essentially to, to, to the, the fracture phenomenon number five. Let, let me go through a, a sort of very quick historical view on how the community has addressed this um, uh, the, this failure um, phenomenon from, um, from a micro-mechanical and microstructure viewpoint. It, it is not unfair to say that from the 60s to probably the year 2000, something like that, the focus of the community was on understanding the growth of the voids. 
Uh, not focusing too much on how they nucleate, not too much on how they, they coalesce, but essentially the growth process. Uh, there's been a lot of effort since McClintock and Rice and Tracy in the late 60s, the famous Gerson model, etc. I, I, I will come back to that at some point, to model the growth process and, and try to predict very well all the radius and the volume fraction of the void evolves with plastic deformation for different loading conditions, taking into account plastic anisotropy, rate effects, and blah, blah, blah. But um, something like 20 years ago or something like that, uh, and, and some people realized that before, huh? but, but there was a uh, really a recrudescence of interest for looking at the final step of when the voids are big enough, they try to interact, they, they tend to interact, and then the process of growth is accelerated. And this is called the, the, the void coalescence process. It's when the plastic deformation stop being homogeneously um, distributed around the voids, but then localizes in the ligament between the voids. In terms of internal lacking or, 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 or a small shear band in between the voids. And people realize that as a matter of fact, this is really the phenomenon of, of fracture. This is the initiation of the fracture process. And so it's very important to, to have um, dedicated models to predict that. And there has been a bunch of work on, 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 that, on that problem. Aside from void growth and void coalescence, uh, people realize certainly since the 90s that there is a problem when we model ductile fracture with finite element method. Uh, with numerical methods, the fact that um, if, if you put damage into a simulation, and this is true for ductile fracture, but this is true for any problem in which you put damage, um, you have a problem of locality. The, the problem becomes ill-posed from a mathematical viewpoint. And basically it means that as more you refine your finite element mesh, if we talk about finite element methods, uh, more you localize your uh, failure phenomena when the damage gets big. And so somehow the only way to solve that problem is, through, is to introduce a length scale um, into, uh, into the, the, the numerical methods and into the model. And that's not easy. People have, have done a lot of work and efforts and studies to, to formulate constitutive models for the damage, which take into account a length scale or several length scales. From a physical viewpoint, for metallurgists, this is of course perfectly natural. We know that inclusions, they are separated by a length. <laughs> and so there is not, that's not a surprise. We need a length scale to enter the problem at some point, at least an, an information about the spacing uh, between the voids. And when I'm reviewing this, somehow you don't see very much the, the, the first step, which is void nucleation. And so since the beginning, of course, all the people working in that field have know that at some point voids, they nucleate and they nucleate on second phase particles uh, by fracture of the particle or decohesion. But there has not been so many studies to, to really try to formulate uh, physics-based nucleation model. They, they are essentially very simple models based on a critical stress or a critical strain to nucleate voids. And, um, Another subject that has not been sufficiently addressed except for the last 10 years is to take into account about uh, of, of shear effects um, in, uh, in the modeling of the tile fracture. So I'm sorry to be a little long on that, but I think it's interesting to, to get some perspective about where to position the, the work here. Um, I will be talking now about two, two subjects. Of course, I mentioned at the end that void nucleation has not received enough attention. So I want to show you that uh, recently uh, some progress has been made and in particular in the work of, uh, of Laurent Anna and, and, uh, and the, the second paper of Mathieu Marteleur, Julien, et cetera. Uh, and I will explain you what, what, what has been found and what has been done there uh, on the nucle void nucleation um, uh, process. And then I will say a, a few words and I already can force in that time will be short. So show you that um, we have been able to, uh, and essentially our colleagues from Liège to, to implement uh, a, a very sophisticated uh, damage Gerson type model in a non-local version that takes into account uh, 
most of the physics I've explained just, just before and, and giving um, no, a, a very um, interesting and, and sophisticated uh, model that we can use to predict failure in, in a variety of loading conditions. So let me start with the work essentially of Florent. Uh, I, I hope Florent is not attending, so I can say anything I want and all the possible mistakes. <laughs> but I, I think he may be attending. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, so Florent, uh, don't, don't shoot any bullet on me at the end. Huh? Okay, so Florent has been working on 6,000 aluminum alloys. Just to, to remind you uh, the typical type of constituents in uh, most aluminum alloys. So at a very small scale, we have the hardening precipitates, which are nanometer scale. At an intermediate uh, mag uh, scale, we have the dispersoids essentially uh, there to, to control grain size. They will be in a range of 100, 200 nanometer size typically. And then the bat in metallic particles, which if we could, we would avoid, but they are there for different reasons and we have to live with them and they are typically in the micron uh, size. When uh, an, al an aluminum alloy is deformed, um, damage will uh, be generated on the intermetallics and at the very end of the deformation process, you can also generate voids on this pursuit. Precipitates are usually too small to, to uh, introduce uh, damage. The big story, the big uh, picture is here. Florent worked on three categories of 6,000 alloys, 6056, 6061, 60, and 6005. Uh, you have the three colors and I will follow this color code for, for the entire presentation. What you see here is the true fracture strain, which is measured really by the reduction of section in a, in a tensile test, in a uniaxial tensile test as a function of the heel stress, which means here that all the sample, all the points you see correspond to a different heat treatment, uh, which allow changing the precipitation state while of course not changing the intermetallic particles. So somehow the starting point of this material is the same distribution of intermetallics, the same distribution of dispersoids, but a different uh, magnitude of the strength. What you see immediately is, of course, that the fracture strain is decreasing with the heel strength, no surprise. But you also see that there is a major difference between the red, the blue, and the green. And by the way, you have each time two curves for uh, tension in the longitudinal or the transverse direction. Changing the fracture strain, true fracture strain from uh, 0.5 to 1.5 is enormous huh? because we're talking here about true strain and not nominal strain. So it's a huge difference. And uh, Florent has done a lot of work on that material and that, that research was initially, was initiated first by Otsimar and then Florent took, took it over. And, and he did a lot of tests and, and a lot of tomography measurements owing to the inter interactions with uh, Eric Mer. So the question is how to understand the difference in fracture strain between these different alloys. Um, so let's, let's try to, to, to see if we cannot find an easy answer just by looking at the strain hardening capacity. And that's what you see at the right. You have the epsilon u is the true strain at necking. So it's the true strain corresponding to uniform elongation. And it's an indicator of course of the strain hardening exponent if you trust consider a criterion. I do trust, consider criterion. Um, and, and what you see typically when you compare this curve, it's one way to see that they have more or less the same resistance to plastic localization, the strain, same strain hardening capacity. So of course, uniform elongation has nothing to do with the true fracture strain, which sometimes is still a mistake you see uh, in, in the literature. So this is fairly obvious. So now let's look at the obvious the volume fraction of intermetallic particles. So the green is so good, probably it's very clean. Well, if you look at the table on the right, what you find is that that's not correct. Uh, they have more or less the same volume fraction of uh, intermetallic particles. Oh, -ho. so that means it's more subtle than just a volume fraction. There is something else. So the 
a, a big part of the work of Florent was to understand what was the something, something else. And you know already what it will be because I, uh, I said that I will be talking about void nucleation. So it has to do with void nucleation. So of course the, um, the instrument that was uh, very, very useful here to, to investigate the, the details of the damage process was uh, 3D microtomography. And you see here an example of uh, 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 an image that was taken after some amount of deformation. And you can see uh, particles that are broken or not broken. And, and Florence spent a lot of time on, on analyzing images. So one important result uh, he can extract from, from, uh, uh, from this observation is the typically the fraction of broken particles uh, as a function of their size and to do a statistical analysis. This is typically what you find. So um, I don't remember what was the alloy here, but uh, whatever, we will have comparison later. So what you see here is that when the particle size is typically below uh, two, one, two micrometers, you don't see much broken particles and that the particles above a certain size typically five, six microns, they are all broken if you look at um, carefully in, in the material. The problem is, of course, it's not that easy to see the broken particles were in the, in the, the small size range due to the limitation of uh, microtomography. Big particles, they also fragment. So they tend to give rise to more than one part. Okay, so let's have a look now at uh, the comparative study of the three different laws. Let's first look at the distribution of size of the intermetallics. And here, what you find on the right is the distribution of sizes of, this, the, of the particles in these three alloys. And as expected, uh, you could anticipate that the 605 has a distribution of much smaller particles compared to the 6056, compared to the 60, uh, 61. Now, if you zoom in carefully, what you find is that the 6056 uh, in the range of big particles has more big particles than the 6061, and that turns out to, to be an, an important message to understand uh, the difference in, in fracture strain. The mean sizes are given in the table. All right. So the, the alloy with the smallest particle is the most ductile, no surprise. Second message, um, in set, set, second important finding of uh, Florent, he distinguished between the original cavities and the cavities that nucleate, the voids that nucleate by uh, particle fracture. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, Florent found that there was a significant amount of pre-existing voids in the material um, related to, to the, the forming process before uh, any mechanical test is, is performed. And what you see, the red are the original voids and the black one are the voids that nucleate on particles. That's not so easy to analyze. And, and fortunately, we had access to a, a tracking procedure to, to, to monitor the voids one by one. Um, and as you can see, even, and you will see next that the initial porosity is relatively small, it, it may have a dominant effect on, on the entire process. So let's compare the different alloys. And this is the table below. What you find is that the alloy uh, uh, 6005 has no initial voids present in the material and almost no initially cracked particles. And when you see the other laws in the order of uh, lower and lower fracture strain, you see that they contain uh, a higher amount of initial voids. So this is a second effect, which combined to the first one to show that 6056 is as something um, more negative compared to, to the other one. So in order to analyze that now in a more quantitative way, um, the idea was to um, look at a, a, a micromechanical model of void nucleation 
and look at the ideas, early ideas of the Beremin group. Huh? The Beremin, Beremin paper is very well known in the field. Beremin is a group of authors made of several colleagues from France and in particular from the Ecole des Mines of Paris, for instance, uh, famous uh, Professor Pinault was a member of the Beremin group. And uh, basically the idea is the following. If you have brittle particles, the failure occurs when the stress in the particle, the maximum principal stress in the particle becomes equal to a fracture stress. This fracture stress of, of the particle is itself the result of a failure mechanism inside the particle related somehow to the fracture toughness of the particle. But that brings us quite far. Um, the idea is that you have tiny defects inside the particles. Bigger is the particle, bigger is the probability to have a larger defect. And so the tendency is to have a lower fracture stress of the particle as the particle is bigger. And that can be treated with a typical Weibull model. And so Florent was using a Weibull distribution analysis. And in that analysis, you have to identify a Weibull stress, a reference volume, if you normalize by the size uh, of, the, of the particle, and uh, the Weibull exponent m. So this is not that easy to, to um, uh, identify this parameter. So we had to, dis to, um, to use a numerical method to do that, so to generate a, a range, a distribution of sizes of particles, district, select three possible values, and then uh, apply the loading that was attained at the location where he made the measurement. And he was using the Beremin model to calculate the stress in the particle based on the knowledge of the macroscopic stress and the strain, and then compare the experimental measurements of evolution of fraction of broken particles as a function of size. And then find iteratively select different values until he would get a good agreement between the experimental measurement of nucleation data uh, and the model. And you know what? Okay, this is fitting. Yeah? So you could say, well, all right, that, that's, that's nice, but, but okay, not more than that. But what is beautiful here is that he could find a single set of parameter which is working for the three alloys. And, and this is showing that it's quite robust and that these intermetallic particles, they probably behave in the same way in the different alloys. So their nature uh, and, and their failure behavior is, is relatively similar in the three alloys. So we decided to leave with this single three numbers for representing the void nucleation in the three alloys. So that was an, an, a nice result. Okay. Um, then, of course, this is only void nucleation. <laughs> uh, if you want to understand the failure process after having a good void nucleation model, you need to predict the growth and then the coalescence of the void. Instead of developing a very advanced um, uh, damage model with the growth and coalescence, like the one I will not explain <laughs> at the end because probably I will be out of time. But uh, Florent developed a, a sort of cellular automaton approach. So the idea is, is relatively simple. Huh? He's distributing, is uh, di generating a, a distribution of particles of different sizes and positions. Then he's distributing. Um, the fracture stresses of the particle based on this variable distribution and is loading step by step his box and is calculating for every particle the stress inside the particle and when in a particle a void has to nucleate then he's nucleating a void and the void is growing following a very simple analytical uh, model which is the rice and tracy model and so the voids are nucleating and at every time step the code calculate, uh, look at the voids pairs one by one and check if the coalescence criterion between the void is met or not. There is absolutely no coupling. So the presence of the void is not influencing the stresses and the strains. So of course this is rudimentary, but it allows accounting for the distribution effects in a nice way. 
you see a finite element simulation somehow in the middle. So you say, well, why, why is this finite element simulation while talking about the cellular automaton? It's just to um, take into account the fact that when we compare the result of the simulations to the experimental data, we have to compare with data coming from 10 sites uh, tests. And of course, the failure process takes place in the necking zone. And if you want to take a box that is sufficiently big with respect to the size of, of the necking region uh, to have enough particles, then of course you have to account for the fact that the stresses and the strains are not the same, whether you look in the middle of the box or a bit above. Or, so the, 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 there is a gradient of stress and strain. So somehow you need to run a finite element simulation to um, determine the evolution of the stress plastic strain and stress cryoxality at the different position within the neck. And this is what is provided to the cellular automaton. But there is no coupling of damage with, with the, the response of the material. Do you see the point? So it just, it, it's just a, a very large distribution of particles. And then there is a si simple micromechanical model that takes the lead. And as a matter of fact, uh, it works uh, extremely well. So there, are, there is only, now I should get things right here, but um, I think there is only a single parameter Florent has to identify uh, in the void growth law in the model. So he, he has to take one experiment to identify one parameter and then keep the parameter constant for the void nucleation law, uh, which have been identified dependently and that single parameter. And then he can look at the response of his model with respect to the response for the different alloys he has been looking at for different yield stresses. And you see the result here. So the model is the dotted line and the continuous line are for the, um, for the uh, experiments. So it's not right on top, but the goal was not to be right on top. The goal was to, to see if the model was rich enough to capture all these different trends. And, and, and of course, the key is to have a good void nucleation law. This is really what explains 90% of the, of the story. Good. Um, so this is just to show the result of the tomography measurements here that have been made and what the model predicts. So qualitatively, you see the evolution of the cellular automaton and, and the tomography measurements um, on the right side, just to a confirmation of, um, of, the, of the, the quality of, of the model. Somehow, this is not good news for the people who have been working on the void growth model for 40 years, like me, and developing, taking into account void shape effects, etc., etc. At the end of the day, uh, the effort on void nucleation is probably as important as on void growth, and same for void coalescence. It's extremely important. There is a last effect uh, um, addressed by Florent, which was to take into account clustering effects. And we have, I've not been talking uh, about the clustering effect before, clustering of the intermetallic particles, but it, it plays a big role as well. So the degree of clustering um, is influencing also the, the, the fracture strain, which, which is an effect that is captured also with the cellular automaton. And that was analyzed by Florent a bit deeper. Okay, um, I'm, I'm looking at the, the time. It's not that I'm looking at, at my phone and, and answering any message. <laughs> Just, I'm watching time. Um, yes, next step. Okay, so intermetallic particles control ductility. I'm defining ductility here as fracture strain. Good. What could we do to improve the material knowing that? Well, my colleague, Oda, many of you know Otsima, Oh, she's an expert in friction stir welding, friction stir processing, uh, which is also the subject of her ERC um, grant. And um, so, but that was before the ERC of Ode. Ode proposed to use F friction stir processing to mix the material and modify the intermetallic particles. And we had three objectives. Objective number one was well, by this intense mixing, 
we will probably break the large particles into smaller particles. The second hope was uh, by friction stir processing, would we close the initial porosity, which I've shown is, is maybe a uh, determinant to uh, also have a significant uh, impact on ductility. And finally, could it help in declustering the intermetallic particles? So of course, when I present things like this, it looks like we anticipated everything and then we try and of course, you all know, huh? you do something and then you reinvent the story after. Um, I, I'm, I, I don't remember anymore if we had all the story in mind before and I don't think so. Um, but but um, let, let's look at what uh, Florent got. So this is the bad one, huh? the 6056, bad. The low, with the lowest fracture strain. So you see here, uh, 3D tomography, microtomography um, uh, images of the material, the base material. After one friction surface processing uh, pass, three passes, one, two, three, and six. On the right, you have the particle size distribution. Red is the base material, black one pass, and then the two others are for three and six. So you see that the effect is significant. The friction surface processing is really breaking the particle into small fragments. And, and you see that very well on, on the tomography. The other good news is um, that if you do, if you use friction surface processing, what you find is that the size of the pre-existing voids and the initial porosity is, oh, so that's the phone. This, I, a cellular phone was off, but, but not the other phone. Uh, and the initial porosity you see is decreasing uh, with the number of passes. So good news, the second effect, it's also working to reduce initial porosity. And finally, this was about, stop the phone. Um, this, is, this was the, the third effect that was expected, which is um, the declustering of the intermetallic particles. And Florent has spent quite a lot of time in defining what is a cluster based on pair distribution analysis, et cetera. And what you see on the right is the typical size of clusters in terms of number of particles plus cluster. I have no time to explain you the exact definition of a cluster, but you see that after one pass, and maybe your eye will tell you that when you look on the left, but the, the size of cluster is first increasing and then decreasing. So after three passes, the, 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 the cluster size has become smaller, which is important for the team. Okay, huh. suspense. And what is the impact on fracture strain? This is the result uh, for the 6056 alloy, the one with the lowest uh, fracture strain. So the base material result was um, the dotted line for the transverse direction and the continuous line for the rolling direction. And if you impose one pass of friction surface processing and you make the measurement in the transverse direction, you see an improvement of the fracture strain, not that big. And if you do six passes, you see an enormous increase of fracture strain. It looks like just a factor two. It is a factor two in true strain, but once again, in terms of engineering strain, real reduction of diameter, this is much bigger, of course. Huh? You have to take the exponential of that. And also the second good news is that the friction surface processing is um, uh, completely uh, uh, getting rid of the anisotropy between longitudinal and transverse direction. So you have here some tomography images in the transverse and rolling direction and for the base material. And now this is for the friction stir process material. You see much less damage. Uh, you see the, the, the more extensive necking, uh, et cetera. Okay, that was the story for the, the, the thesis of Florent. I know that uh, I'm already talking for almost uh, 35 minutes. So Maria, if you allow me, I will just cover the, the next subject and probably fortunately for most of you, 
I will not enter the complicated equations. And I'm sorry if my colleague from Lege are um, following, but I, I think this is this is fair for everybody. If I'm, I'm just covering the next step. It's much shorter, and and it's somehow more classical. But 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 uh, it, it's still I think interesting to to talk about it. So now high strength steel, very typical high strength steel used for armors and. Um, uh, typical steel where we'll, when you make cross section, what you, what you find are essentially in terms of particle distribution, uh, large uh, sulfide manganese inclusions, and uh, some smaller size carbides. Of course, the uh, sulfide manganese inclusions are elongated in the longitudinal direction. And so there is a very significant uh, anisotropy of uh, morphological anisotropy of the particles. So the volume fraction of uh, particle has been um, measured and the, the shape of the particle carefully measured. We um, performed a very extensive set of mechanical tests. So the work I explained before was essentially based on tensile testing, uniaxial tensile testing. But in this work, we wanted to uh, have a, a very large experimental basis for identification, validation of the model I would have presented in the second pass, in the second part of, of the talk. And, and so we had to vary the most important mechanical parameters in ductile fracture, which are the stress triaxiality that drives the growth, the void growth process, as well as the so called load parameter which has been recognized for the last 20 years to also have a big effect on, on void growth and, um, and on void coalescence. So what you see here are data that are given in terms of the equivalent plastic strain at fracture as a function of the stress triaxiality, which is given as the x-axis for different values of the load variable. And this, is, this variation in stress triaxiality and load variable are obtained by changing the specimen uh, configuration from round bar, cylindrical bars, notch round cylindrical bars, flat bars, flat bar with notches and plain strain specimen with or without groove. So which allow changing both stress triaxiality, like I said, and load variable. And what you see is the typical at load variable typical of, uh, of equal to one, which is for uh, cylindrical specimen, you see the typical decrease of ductility with stress triaxiality. But you see that for other type of, play, of specimen like the plane strain, you may have strange behaviors as you change both the triaxiality and the load variable, showing that there are effectively two, um, uh, two load parameters that, that control the, the two invariants of the stress tensor that control the process. So back on the uh, damage aspects and the void nucleation, which is the, the, the core message of what I, would, I wanted to discuss today. So these are the fractured surfaces, very different whether you look in longitudinal and perpendicular direction, really indicating that the void nucleation process, which is connected to the sulfide manganese inclusion with very significant shape effects affect the complete process leading to completely different fracture surfaces. And many of you have ever seen, of course, fracture surfaces before. What we wanted to do uh, to, to accomplish, and that was really the work of Julien, Julien Leclerc, was to extend the void nucleation process to make it uh, anisotropic. And he, he took the original model of Beremin, once again, a group of people, not, there is not a person named Berimin. And he transformed that model into uh, an anisotropic, a 3D model, assuming both that the void nucleation stress, so the critical stress you have to attain to break the particle or the interface is orientation dependent, and also calculating correctly the maximum principal stress in the particle as a function of the orientation. And also taking into account the fact that 
depending on the mechanism of void nucleation, depending on the orientation of the particle with respect to the, to the loading, you may have the cohesion of voids or particle fragmentation. And the amount of, of cavities in terms of volume fraction of voids you nucleate differs between these two uh, phenomena. Uh, the two mechanisms lead to a different volume of voids at the beginning. And so depending what you get, you have to take that into account in what you nucleate. And as we know from the previous discussion, this has a big impact on the entire process. So Julien had to look at how to quantify the volume fraction of void that is generated for mechanism number one and for mechanism number two. And by simple geometrical arguments, what you find is that the number, the volume fraction of voids that is nucleated when you break the particle into fragments in the direction of the particle, when the loading is more in the direction of the particle, is approximately equal to the volume fraction of particles. And when you have the second mechanism, it's more the volume fraction of particles multiplied by the square root of the uh, particle aspect ratio. If you want to learn more about it, read the paper, and this is explained in detail. Two more slides and I'm done. So, this model had to be calibrated, and that's what Julien did to find what was the right uh, aspect ratio to take into account in the model. And to identify the model, what he did, he had values obtained by Mathieu on the evolution of the porosity as a function of the distance from the fracture surface. There was no microtomography here, just the old fashioned, very good method, which is polish the specimen below the fracture surface, measure the porosity by taking a lot of images. And as you move from the fracture surface, of course, you decrease the strain that is applied and you need a finite element simulation to back out the strain corresponding to the region at which you're looking. So you can generate then a, 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 a void a porosity evolution uh, as, you, as you move away from, from, the, from the, the, the crack surface. So Julien, identified his void nucleation uh, parameters and provided then to his very complicated Gerson model that I will not cover after with the data. And of course he had one more parameter to tune in the Gerson model in order to, uh, to make the model running and compare then the predictions to the measurements. And what you see here are the predictions compared to the experimental values for the evolution of fracture strain with the notch size. Basically, that means an increase of stress triaxiality in the case of cylindrical notch round bars. And once again, you see that the model is rich enough to, to quantify, to capture the effect of stress triaxiality, but also to capture the effect of the anisotropy between uh, loading in the longitudinal or transverse direction. And once again, the key message is that this is dictated essentially by the conditions of void nucleation. And, and basically this is it. So I will just rush through the slides to see what you fortunately will miss uh, 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 a sophisticated damage model. Well, let me just tell you this on this slide. The model is based on the idea that the damage process is controlled after void nucleation by three possible mechanisms. The growth of the void, the coalescence by internal necking, or the coalescence by shear. And these three mechanisms related to the growth of the void and coalescence are described with three yield surfaces. Of course, there is the void nucleation before. And basically, this is a plasticity model with three yield surfaces formulated in a non-local framework. So this is what makes the analysis and, and the model really interesting. It, the results are mesh independent. Uh, they capture this, the slant fracture mode, the, the cup and cone fracture. And the model also captured the effect of the load variable. Uh, uh, this is what this slide shows here that you have an effect of stress triaxiality and load variable that is well captured by the model. Uh, some nice simulations here 
uh, by uh, Van Zoom. And I'm at the end, so uh, the conclusions and the, the message, the, the take home message that um, I want you to give is void nucleation is complicated, but we have to spend more time in understanding all the voids appear, nucleate, the distribution effects, etc. If we want to to really build realistic and and quantitative uh, failure models for for uh, ductile metals, void coalescence is also very important. And there are nowadays void coalescence models that are not very complicated that you can use instead of using a critical porosity or something like that. There are some nice void coalescence criteria. Um, today, finite element formulation and, and the specific one I have shown here very quickly is based on the discontinuous Galerkin formulation, um, are able to capture all these fine details of the ductile process, ductile failure process. My recommendation for those of you who are more on the physics side, metallurgy side, this is becoming very sophisticated in terms of numerical methods. And, and it's very nice to team up with uh, experts. And that's um, the, this very nice collaboration we have with uh, Ludovic and, and his team. Because the, if you want to do these kind of things with Abacus, for instance, it's very complicated. It's almost impossible to get cracks running and, and then get the cup and cone, et cetera. You, you really need more, more sophisticated numerical method, and in particular, to take into account non-local effect. And based on that, um, I think I'm at the end and I thank you very much for your attention.